Okay, so last week we covered global spatial order correlation, four different views of that, the two that use the waste matrix, Moran's I and Geary C, and then two that are based on distance as a metric, the non-parametric correlogram and the variogram. So today we focus on the local version of this. As I mentioned, the global statistic is good for assessing patterns of non-randomness, but most of the patterns that we deal with are not random, so it's kind of automatic that it's significant. But where, where are the cores of these patterns? What is interesting? What are the hot spots? What are the cold spots? That's what we start to focusing, focus on today. So the next three lectures, really, this one and the next two, deal with different concepts of clusters. And today we focus as clusters as special locations that stand out in some way. And then the next two weeks we'll focus on clusters as groupings of locations that are similar in some way. And so that's basically the core of the material you will need for your assignment. Then the last week I'll talk about odds and ends, different things. But that doesn't have a lab, so it doesn't really, is not part of the assignment. So everything you need for the assignment will be covered before Thanksgiving. Okay, the principle of a local indicator of spatial association. So as I mentioned several times, the global measure of spatial order correlation does not tell you uh, where the clusters are. It tells you that the pattern in the data as a whole is not something you would expect under spatial randomness, but it doesn't tell you where or why, right? So then, as opposed to this, cluster detection really wants to know where's the action. Where are the hot spots? Where are the cold spots? That's really, in an exploratory sense, really what it's about. Because then the next question is, of course, once you've identified the patterns, the clusters, the hot spots, the next question is why? Why are these places different from other places in, in some respect? So today we'll focus on two important aspects of this. What are these locations? Where are they? And then also, how can we assess significance? And I will spend quite a bit of time on that part because it's actually very complex. And it's um, not just unique to the spatial analysis, but it's an issue that has come up more and more as we move into uh, computer age statistical inference. There's a book with that title by Efron and Hasty, which is really, if you have a little bit of statistics background, it's a fascinating discussion of the changing perspectives as computers have allowed us to analyze both bigger data sets, but also use the computing, the computer and computing to construct statistical tests that we could do otherwise. So, um, and I have to say, there are many cluster detection methods. It's on my to-do list. One of these years, I'll have a course just on spatial clusters, but I'm not, I don't have time yet. So here's this concept, local indicators of spatial association, or LISA. And LISA turned um, 21 last year, but you know. So I have a paper, LISA at 21. Um, so it's a local spatial statistic. There's one for each location. And there's another twist to it, which is a bit technical. It's not really that used that much. It has, um, it, it's useful for diagnostics purposes, just to see how your global statistic comes about. And that's the connection between the local and the global. So the sum of the leases, there's one for each location. So if you add them up, there is a connection to the global statistic. So when we talk about the local Moran statistic in a few minutes, we'll see that the uh, global Moran statistic is actually the average of the local Moran. So there's a connection between the global and the local, which then allows us to think about things like leverage, influential points, those kinds of things that I mentioned in the context of the Moran scatter plot. Uh, uh, but we'll, we can do this much more detailed. So there are two aspects to this. Very importantly, how do we assess the significance of the statistic at each location? 
And then how do we use this information on significance to identify two types of patterns? We've already seen this in our classification of spatial autocorrelation through the Moran scatter plot. We saw the notion of spatial clusters, either high, high, low, low, or the notion of spatial outliers that are locations with observations that are very different from the neighbors. So both of these we'll try to identify. And then in terms of interpretation of significance, we have to worry about whether there is global spatial autocorrelation or not. And since there is a connection between the local statistics and the global statistic, in most situations in practice, um, you have both significant global autocorrelation and significant local autocorrelation. And then the question, it's a technical question, but it comes up all the time. To what extent is your assessment of significance of the local statistic influenced by the presence of global significant autocorrelation? And these are technical issues, but as we'll see um, in practice, I, I have a very pragmatic approach to dealing with this. And that's basically, and it's all about learning from site and by use around and we'll see how to do that in the lab, you really do get a sense of where are the things that really matter and where the noise. Technically, mathematically, it's very simple, at least I think it's very simple. We saw that many, well, all the global statistics we've seen so far, the Moranzai and the Giri C, are double sums. Sum over all the observations of a sum over J where J typically is the other observations with a weight that's the spatial weight. So any statistic, and many can be written this way globally as a, a sum, really, of a component for each observation separately. So it has to be able to be separated by observation. If you connect different observations, then it doesn't work. And so basically, uh, there's a separate entity for each I, then that separate entity is the local statistic. And we'll see in a few minutes how that works out mathematically. It's actually much simpler than it sounds. So I'm going to start with the local Moran and the local Geary statistics, which are local versions of the ones we saw last week. And those are both technically leases in that they connect to the global statistic and all that stuff. And then I'll go, I'll cover some, um, an, a slightly different flavor of local statistic, which was developed by Geddes and Ord, which is very similar in nature, but yet a little bit different. And it's not technically ELISA because there's no connection with a global statistic. And then I'll talk about some interpretation issues and odds and ends and extensions, depending on how much time I have. So um, we know from last week that uh, Moran Xi is basically a double sum over i and j of wij, zi, zj divided by the variance. The variance doesn't change by observation, so we don't have to worry about that. So in essence, we have something that is the product of z at i, then something that's constant, we don't have to worry about, and then basically the spatial lag, the weighted sum of the values at the neighboring observations. So this is the cross product between the value at an observation and its spatial lag, as opposed to or as, a, as compared to the cross product between the value at a location and the one at another location separated by a given distance. We use that concept in constructing the correlogram. So there's a very similar concept, but it's only it doesn't look at all the pairs of other locations. It only looks at the neighbors and it summarizes the information in the neighbors by the spatial lag. So the spatial lag is the sum of Wij uh, times the Z uh, J for all the Js, but we know that Wij is zero for most of these Js, so it only counts for the neighbors. It's the average of the neighbors. And to keep being simple, there's some technical reasons for this. We use row standardized weights, and so the, these 
dividers, the S sub zero, the sum of all the weights, and N, they cancel out. So that's all it is. It's um, some constant that doesn't change by location. So for all practical purposes, we can ignore it. And then the cross between a value and its spatial lag. And remember in the Moran scatter, what we are plotting is the value, the zi on the x-axis, and the spatial lag on the y-axis. So the points in the Moran scatter plot have a direct connection to these cross products because you know the regression fit is basically a cross product statistic. It's close connection. So then again, as I said, more from a technical point of view, the sum of the local Moran I statistics is n times the global, n being the number of observations, so you can flip this around, and the global is the average of the local. What do we use this for? Well, as I said, not very often, but you might be interested in finding out are there some influential locations that drive the global statistic. But uh, actually, A will be more interested in these influential locations per se, in and of themselves, and identify them potentially as cluster cores or spatial outliers, as the case may be. Inference is a pain. Okay? You can do it analytically, but it's an approximation, and it's a terrible approximation. And without getting too technical, in a nutshell, approximations are based on uh, large sample ideas. The idea that you can approximate what happens in the statistic if the data set conceptually grows and grows and grows and grows. One of the problems with the local statistic is that because it is a local estimate and the number of neighbors is basically limited and fairly small, it doesn't actually grow and grow and grow. Even though mathematically you can go through all the contortions and derive all you want, conceptually this approximation isn't really happening. It would only be happening as if your neighbors are, say, within a radius, and that the radius gets populated ever more densely, which is a different view of space than, than we're using here. So for all practical purposes, we have to use a computation. And conditional permutation is essentially the same as permutation, but repeated for each individual location. Remember, the statistic is the cross product of the value z at location i and its spatial lag. z at i doesn't change. So think of a, a pot of value. We take out z of i, and then we reshuffle the other ones. In, in fact, we don't really reshuffle them. We pick out k values. If there are k neighbors, we randomly, without replacement, pick out k values out of the pot and compute the spatial lag for those k values. And we do this many, many times. And this, just like with the global Moran's eye, creates a reference distribution for that location, for the statistic at that location. So if for the global Moran's eye we did permutation, say, 999 times, in the local we do 999 times as many times as we have observations, as many times as we have locations. So very quickly, this can get crazy, right? You have 3,000 counties, 999 permutations times 3,000. This gets big very quickly, so you have to worry about the computational. What do we do with all this? Um, two things. First, we identify the locations that are significant. And <laughs> Let's leave aside for the moment what the right p-value should be. Let's just say we take a p-value. If, you know, just like we did with the global statistic, we look at our reference distribution, we get a pseudo p-value that gives us how many times is the reference distribution equal to or larger than the observed value. And then we uh, record that. If that p-value is less than whatever we pick, let's say, for the sake of the argument, 0.05, we say it's significant. If it's not, then we forget about it. And this is very important to keep in mind, and I stressed this earlier as well, 
If it's not significant, it doesn't exist. So don't try to say anything about it being positive or negative. It's not significant. So for all practical purposes, locally, not globally necessarily, but locally, focused on that particular location, the particular layout of values and the surrounding neighbors is spatially random. That's what that means. So the local significance map essentially is a map with green colors that show you, shows you which of these locations are significant. And um, everything that's not significant is white, Does not there. So this is in contrast with some other pieces of software that give gradations for every observation um, that can be very misleading because if it's not significant, it really isn't there. So the other thing that this is very useful for, and we'll revisit this when we discuss what p-value we have to use, is that it gives you a sense of how significant these locations are. So the um, example I will be using throughout, except for my last slides, because I have time, is uh, a, actually kind of a, a fun data set. It's based on a, an essay by a French uh, sociologist, Guéry, in 1830. And it's the moral statistics of France in 1830. It's things like crime, literacy, donations, suicides. It's one of the first historic multi that were done quantitatively. So this is the data set, um, the Geoda sample data sets. It comes with the software. Uh, I just picked a variable donations because even though I say never do this, if you look at the map, you know, you can see some structuring. I'm not going to call it clusters, but there is something going on. You know, these colors are too similar in big areas of the map and under randomness. You shouldn't see that. It should be all over the place. So um, this is our significance map for the local Moran statistics. So um, using, um, and I went a little crazy here, 99,999 permutations. It's very fast. I mean, Geoda is, for this calculation, completely paralyzed. So you can actually scale this up uh, fairly well. So. Uh, the reason I did this is because it shows you the gradation of significance. So the darker the green color, the more significant it is. In other words, the fewer values from the reference distribution were more extreme than the one that we observed. Right? And so we start at 0.05, P0 .05 and then we go up all the way to 0 0.00001, which is the most extreme you can get with that number of permutations. That means, in other words, none of the reference values were larger than, you know, none of the 99,999 reference values were larger than the one that we observed. So you see some gradation, but as such, this isn't really that useful. It's really to me, one of the most um, effective. Uh, yeah. yeah. What does the like gradation mean, right? Like either you're a cluster or you're not. So mm -hmm. how come this is about how the exactly. That's what this is about. Okay. Perfect lead in. You don't know what it is about. You just know it's significant. So this um, what local cluster map actually makes the connection between the significance and the Moran scatter plot. The Moran, Moran scatter plot centers the observations on the mean and gives you four kind of types of spatial association. So the two that are surrounded by similar neighbors, we call them clusters, high, high, low, low. And then the opposite, which we call spatial outliers, high, low, low, high. So what the cluster map does behind the scenes, it looks up where these significant points are in terms of the Moran scatter plot, and then gives them a color based on where they are. So um, this is the mechanism, right? You can think of this as going on. 
connected all the points in the upper right quadrant, which are above the mean, surrounded by neighbors above the mean. So we call this high high. And then we see a significance map that some of these are significant, but many of them are not. So the gray areas, this is the way selection works in uh, the default selection in Yoda. So the transparency is affected. So the ones that are not significant and the green ones are the significant. And so then what we do, again behind the scenes, and come up with four different colors. So in this case, the red ones are nothing but the significant ones from the selection that we had before. And then we see that, in fact, I think nine points out of the original 22 in that quadrant are in fact significant at 0.05. And I get back to that in a few minutes. So that's how you get this. Then, in some sense, you look it up in the Moran scatter plot and you classify them as four different types of local statistics. And in a minute, I'll talk about the difference between clusters and outliers. But basically, this is what it looks like. So, 0.05 is very liberal. 29 significant locations. Uh, the red, red ones, high, high clusters, but they're really not clusters. They're the core of a cluster. Because the cluster, the notion of a cluster is that that location is more similar to its neighbors than would be the case randomly. So the neighbors should really be part of the cluster. And I'll get to that in a second. And then the dark blue ones are low, low. So from the other quadrant, the uh, lower left quadrant in the Moran scatter plot, uh, these are also cores of clusters. So the cluster itself is this location with its neighbors. And then the two other colors, and the reason I picked donations is that it actually shows all four types. Most cases in practice, you don't get that. You get two, almost never. So the low high ones are the uh, light blue ones. There's two of them. And the high low ones uh, is the light red rosy type. There's one of them. And so what happens when you go from 0.05 to 01 is basically actually here. So you go from 0.05, which includes all the lighter colors, to only the darker color, and so they shrink to, and that, you know, of all this red stuff, only those two in the top are left, and of all the blue stuff, it shrinks. Uh, and you look up, there's much more darker green at the south part than there was up north. There was mostly 0.05 and then the darker ones were in the bottom, which as you crank up the p-value, or make it smaller actually, then this will shrink even more. See more examples of this later on. So um, let's look at the outliers. So the outliers are locations that are surrounded by neighbors are either outliers. Cluster map, that's the red one with its neighbors, defined by contiguity. And this is our natural breaks map, where you see that you have a darker color surrounded by lighter colors. So it picks that up. Of course, this is a simplification into six gradations. So it's basically a histogram. You know whether they're at the high end or the low end of the, the statistics. And similarly, um, this is the low-high outlier, and blue is surrounded by its neighbors, and you see the, it's light brownish surrounded, especially by this really dark brown, which is an outlier. And since these statistics are the average of the neighbors, if you have really extreme values in there, it will pull everything up, and that's significant. Pretty straightforward. I mean, 
pairs, they are what they are. They are the location that you're interested in. Clusters, a little bit different, because the cluster is really, as I mentioned, the neighbors, right? So uh, what do we do with these neighbors? Well, we can select them, and we'll see in the lab how we do that. So let's say, um, let's start on the right-hand side, point oh one call them, and I find that they're neighbors. So the gray ones are the neighbors that are not significant, and then, of course, the blue ones, you can't see significant. You know, in the example up on top, there aren't any, but in the example with the blue uh, units, some of the blue units are neighbors of each other, so they're not gray, they're blue, but they're selected. And then if you see how that map over to the is a connection and the, the connection is really it's all depending on significance so when these are fairly strong associations then you see that the um, core at a say a p01 0.01 with its neighbors roughly corresponds to the spatial imprint of all the cores at p05 0.05 right and for the red ones, it's basically the same thing, but it's not the same for the ones in the center. That's what I mean by learning from the data, by assessing how these patterns change as you change the p-values. Right? And basically, the bottom line at the end of the story is that something really interesting is going on in the south of France in terms of donations. People don't give any money to charity. Now, why is that? That's the next question. We don't answer that. Right, but something you would expect a priori. This is something you learn from the data, unless, of course, you're an expert on France in the 1830s, then you might know that already. But uh, that's not the point. So local Moran, I think, very straightforward. You just basically decompose the numerator of the Moran's I statistic, then you carry out conditional permutation analysis to find the locations that are significant, and then you classify them. And you classify them. You can't classify them directly. You can't say positive or negative. You know, you have to combine it with the information that's embedded in the Moran scatter plot, uh, which is in Geoda is done behind the scenes. So then the local Geary statistic will be uh, similar. So we have the global version, just to refresh your memory. Instead of a cross product statistic, this is a square difference statistic. And the denominator is again some measure of variance that we knew used to standardize everything. And then the local version again has something that is pretty constant here, we don't have to worry about. So, in essence, it's this thing, which is instead of a cross product, it's a weighted sum of distances in attribute space. So you can think of the difference between the value at i and the value at j squared as a measure of distance in attribute space. If you think of the values as, say, located on a line, then the distance between them, the square distance between them is exactly this. So then we'll extend this notion later to more than one dimension, which is very straightforward. But that's, that's the idea. Now, um, as we saw last week, C is not the same as Moran's I. Moran's I, positive means positive, negative means negative. Geary C is the other way around. Because it's square differences, means large square differences, means dissimilarity, means negative spatial autocorrelation. And negative means small square differences, means similarity, therefore positive spatial autocorrelation. As long as you have that in your head, there's no confusion, right? One is a cross product. It has to do with linear association. The other one is a square difference, which has to do with distance in attribute space. There's nothing linear about it. The, the distance works for nonlinear associations as well. 
that's the, the main difference between the two. So then we can do some analytical derivations. Um, fun, but that useful. The mean expected value of the local Geary C under spatial randomness is 2. You may recall that the mean for the global C Geary C was 1, but the global Geary C had this 1 half thing there. See the 2 in the, um, in the denominator of the numerator. You divide by 2 S sub 0. Uh, that having made the mean be 1. So when you don't do this, which we don't in the local statistic, we end up with the mean being 2. But it's basically the same idea. In practice, we do conditional permutation, the ex exact same thing as we did with Murray and Zai. So <clears throat> we take a value, it's conditional, we take it out of the pot, and then we select k neighbors and compute the square distance to the neighbors and take the weighted average. That's it. So how do we interpret this? Very important. Get away from linear association. You know, I know it's difficult, but it's all about distances. It's all, it's not about slopes, it's about distances. So that's a different way of measuring attribute similarity. Um, it's distance in attribute space. So smaller values mean similarity, large values means dissimilarity. And then the statistic itself is nothing but a weighted average of these distances in attribute space. So think of uh, our line again. We have one value here. Let's say we have three neighbors, one here, one there, one there. We compute the difference between them, square it, and take the average. That's the statistic. And so this is kind of a summary measure, just like Geary C was, a summary measure of the, the distance in attribute space, but the extent to which that is reflected in geographical space. Because we don't take the distance between all the pairs, we only take the distances to the geographic neighbors. And so the question is really fundamentally underlying this, is the distance to these geographic neighbors different from the distance to any arbitrary set of neighbors or locations really, right? And if it is, then we have locally an indication of higher similarity between that value and its neighbors, or higher dissimilarity, than would be the case randomly. So it's the same idea as under the local Moran's eye, but it is applied to a measure of attribute similarity that squared difference rather than a cross product. As I said, interpretation, as long as you keep this straight in your head, it's very straightforward. You know, large is negative, small is positive. And it's all relative to the mean. So what we're going to do is, uh, with these reference distributions, we do, you know, whatever, 99,999 permutations, and we have the mean, and then we look, where is the local Geary C relative to this mean? Is it smaller than it, then greater similarity, or is it larger than greater dissimilarity? And then, so it's in a sense a one-sided test in, in that sense. So then, you know, again, the question, we have the, sim the significant locations. What do we do with this? How do we interpret this? And this is um, not as straightforward as the Moran scatter plot, because in essence, the Moran scatter plot uses the same criterion of similarity as the Moran statistic. I mean, there's, there's a cross product rationale but behind the linear fit to the points in the Moran scatter plot. So there's a sense a one to one correspondence and that's what we exploited to do our cluster map. Um, here we have square differences. There's no such counterpart. We can still look at the extent to which these significant locations, where they are located in the Moran scatter plot, to interpret that as high, high, or low, low, but it's that's what Geary C tells us. It doesn't tell us high, high, low, low. 
connecting the Geary C to the Moran scatter plot can give us some insight into high, high, low, low, but not always. And so there's this kind of strange category of other. We don't know whether it's high, high, or low, low. They're very similar, but in some sense they cross the mean. So they're on either side of the mean. One may be high above the mean, the other below the mean, but they're very close together. So in Moran Xi, because it's a cross product, you don't have that issue. It's one or the other. Here, because it's a different criterion, there are situations where we cannot conclude. We can conclude this location is more similar to its neighbors than it would be randomly, but we can't conclude necessarily it's because both values are high and similar, or both values are low and similar. So we have this other category. And with negative uh, as autocorrelation, we're totally, uh, we can't do anything because we're squaring the difference. So by squaring the difference, we don't know which way it goes. So it could be high, low, low, high. Since we're squaring it, we're losing the sign. So we could just, we can only say it's uh, this. I hate to call it substantive, but the interpretation of the significant locations for the local Geary is not as rich as for the local Moran. The, you know, what you gain for that, if in some sense, is that it is not constrained by linear, but it can capture points that are close together in the linear work. You know, in the, in the cluster literature, you know, you have all these kind of sample data sets, and some of them are the, like, I call them the croissants. You know, you have these sort of arcs, you know, and the arcs are all similar locations. But a linear method can't pick that up because it just looks for a line through it and can't do anything with it. Methods based on distance can because they look at closeness, not so much at linear association. So it's not really an either or, it's both are techniques, whether there are any interesting patterns in the data. That's how I would put it. So this is an example of where uh, we are able to draw a conclusion. So I'll, I'll get um, to the details in a second. But this is um, the same variable. And I've highlighted the locations here in the bottom, uh, low, low locations. And they are significant in the significance map, and then you can see in the Moran scatter plot through the linking mechanism, and we'll get more into that in the lab. You can see that actually. So, really, the logic is the other way. You know, you select the logic that the software does, is you see in the scatter plot where are these points? Are they significant? If yes, then they are low, low. If they're in the high, high thing, if they're significant, then they're high, high. Then the other ones that are significant and are smaller than the mean, they're similar, but we don't know what kind. So, and then the negative ones, I mean, in this case, larger than the mean, they're uh, colored. Blue, and in our case, we have two of them. So this is then um, the illustration of the fact that we don't know, really know negative outliers. We just know they're very different from their neighbors, but we don't know whether this is high-low or, or low-high. You know, this is um, the quandary with the negative association. So these two points do not, uh, like they do in the Moransky plot, they fall either in the upper left or lower right quadrant. Here they could be anywhere. So that's um, we have this um, cluster map. Um, I couldn't find one that had other positive, uh, but every once in a while you see that. So the dark uh, brown red is high high. The um, I'm not good with colors. Let's just call it orangey color is low, low, and then we have two blue outliers. And as we make more precise the significance, we see again that a whole bunch of these disappear. 
But we keep ending up with this grouping in the south of France, which is the same that we had before. You have the middle part, which, if you recall with the local Moran, that middle part disappeared when we went from 0.05 to 0.01. So this is picking something up that is a little bit different from the local Moran. Okay. So when you compare the two, um, <coughs> the, I am still working on this, and it's, you know, as I try more examples, I start seeing more differences and similarities. It seems to me that for the same type, the same p-value cutoff, uh, at least in my uh, experience since I've been working on this, which is about a year ago, um, in many, many different applications, that you tend to pick up more of the significant locations with Geary C, especially at 0.05. But basically forget about 0.05. 0.05 is just to kind of to give you a broad set of reference, but that is by no means a good p-value. But as you crank it up, they tend to converge to similar um, locations. Uh, there are always some important differences, and to me these point to potential nonlinearities in the association. If they were identical, there would be no point in picking one over the other, um, but they're not identical. So each of them contributes something contribute something to the uh, insight and patterns of the data. Um, so, you know, there, as long as you remember, it's a different type of attribute similarity. It's not the same thing, so there's no reason they should be the same. Actually, um, this is not discussed much in the future, but if you do a lot of applied work, you'll run into that. Uh, the global Moranzi and the global Geary C by no means always agree either. You know, there are differences between these two. And the, uh, the quandary here is that um, these are so-called diffuse tests. So in testing hypotheses, you know, you have a null hypothesis that says, in our case, spatial randomness. The alternative hypothesis is no spatial randomness, right? Some spatial patterning of some sort, right? So what kind of spatial patterning can it be? Well, it can be patterning according to a cross product type of rationale, or it could be patterning by having close locations looking, using a distance kind of rationale. The problem with any diffuse test is that you don't know which one it is. All you're doing is you're rejecting the null, and you can say positive or negative spatial autocorrelation, but you cannot say this is caused by this specific model, as opposed to a focus test, say a regression analysis, and you all know what a t-test is on a coefficient, that's a very focused test. It says this coefficient is zero, this one, not any coefficient, this one, or it's not. So very focused. You know exactly if you reject a null, you know what's going on, right? Here, if you reject a null, you sort of know what's going on. You know it's not spatially random, it's either positive or spatial autocorrelation, but you don't know where the spatial autocorrelation comes from. What is the underlying model? What is the underlying process that yielded the pattern? It's about patterns, it's not about... And um, so we don't know what the alternative is. So then the third set of statistics, as I mentioned, it's actually a little bit older than the local Moran and the local Geary, uh, <coughs> is based, I, I mentioned, it's not at least in a strict sense, and doesn't, doesn't really, or initially, it didn't have a connection to a global statistic with a little bit of algebra and a different lo global statistic. You could kind of go in the reverse. But importantly, this is not based on a cross-product logic or on a distance, square distance, kind of logic, but is based on the point pattern lo logic. And we uh, haven't really covered point patterns, and I'll talk a little bit about that the last week in kind of the you know, miscellaneous lecture. Uh, but essentially, in point pattern analysis, uh, 
the object is the same. Is the pattern that we see of the points, is that something that's spatially random, or is there some structure in this? In other words, are points closer together than they would be, or are they further apart than they would be? And one of the ways in which you can assess that is by basically counting how many points there are within a given radius. And you know, or you can, derive under spatial randomness what is the expected number of points in a given radius. So if you have many more points clustering, if you have many fewer points, dispersal. So that's basically the logic. So, and Art Geddes has done a lot of work on point patterns during his career. So uh, Geddes and Ort came up with a statistic that is uh, basically a ratio of the, um, and there's two, two versions of it. So basically, you can think of it as counting points in a given radius relative to all the points in the map. And then you translate points in actual magnitudes. You have a variable x. Sum all the values of x for all but the location that you're looking at. So you have the location, and then you take all the x's. And then in the numerator, you count all the x's that are within a given radius as or whatever neighbors are defined by the weight. You can think of this as a similar as similar to the point line, but instead of just counting the points, you actually add up the values observed at those locations. And again, the, the logic is the same. If these this ratio is higher than it would be on the randomness, then we have clustering of high values. If it's lower than what we would expect random, under randomness, then we have the opposite. Then we have fewer values than we would expect it, and that is called uh, negative spatial autocorrelation. So the two statistics are very similar. The uh, uh, GI statistic excludes the value at the location itself. The GI star statistic, uh, we'll get to this. Ah, shoot. Well, I'll come back. The GI star statistic uh, includes the value at the location. So the, um, the GI statistic is like a donut, right? You, you don't take the value in the middle, and then you take the ring, and you compare the values in that ring to all the values outside of the core. Whereas the GI star window, you include the value in the middle of the donut, in the window, in the numerator, and you take all the values in the denominator. As a result, this denominator is the same for all observations, because it's the sum of all values. But same logic, there's more value in our little window than there would be on average, then there's something going on there, a clustering of high values. If it's lower, if it's much less, then it's the other way around. So let me backtrack now. Inference, approximation, no good. Again, conditional permutation to the rescue, right? Same principle, everything is the same. We can do a significance map, we can do a cluster map. The uh, great advantage, the uh, Geddes Oort statistics relative to the local Moran, is that you have the interpretation right away. So in the local Moran, you have this extra step of going through the scatter plot to figure out what is going on. With the local Geary, it's even more complicated. Here, positive is positive, negative is negative. So positive is called a hot spot, negative is called a cold spot. So the hot spot is the reds, the cold spot is the blues. If you have a good visual memory, you will recognize this as exactly the same map as we had with the local Moran's eye, except for two uh, differences that I'll show you in a second. In my experience, there isn't really a lot of difference between the GI and the GI statistic. These uh, maps are exactly the same. And I did do the analyses separately. I, did. I will do this in the lab. In fact, you can see it by the ledger is the different one uh, in exact same pattern. <clears throat> so again, the advantage is hot spots, cold spots, right? So uh, 
again, as I said before, if it's not significant, it doesn't exist. Positive is local clustering of elevated values. Again, you have to take this with a grain of salt. This is high relative to the mean, right? If the mean is low, then high is also low. But it's always relative to the mean. And negative is cold spots. It doesn't do spatial outliers. So that's a, a drawback. So in comparison with the local Moran, obviously I'm a little biased and so I always look, use the local Moran, almost always. Um, you know, when there is no negative spatial autocorrelation, when you don't care about outliers, then as we saw, the results are basically the same. Um, so it doesn't really matter which one you use. And it's, uh, I mean, in the old days, it was easier to use the Geddes or statistic because you looked at the sign and you knew hotspot cold stop. You did a Moran scatterplot roundabout way. Um, that's the basic essential difference between the two. As I, I mentioned before, you typically get the same results in terms of the clusters. Um, uh, remember, these are clusters also in the Getty Sword statistics, so they are the cores of the clusters. We have to do the thing with the neighbors, same idea. But um, as you see, this is exactly the same except, you know, what is read in the Geddes Oort statistic are, is identified as outliers for Moran, and same with the blues. So one of the blues is an outlier in a cross product sense, and um, no, two of the, well, one of these blues in the local uh, Geddes statistic is identified as an outlier in the local Moran, and the two of the reds are. That's the main difference. But as you crank it up, and I don't have it, but as you crank it up to um, 0.01, there are no more outliers in the local Moran, so then it's identical. OK, this is the hard part. So lots of discussion in the literature about inference, power, um, getting approximations to the distribution. Uh, this is very technical literature. I just want you to know it's there. The essence of the problem, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is a generic problem that is becoming uh, really prevalent in modern statistical analysis for larger data sets, particularly in the uh, analysis of genomic data. You know, large ge genomic databases a large number of variables, large number of observations, the game changing in terms of what is a p-value, right? Uh, so we run into this problem as well. So uh, technically a p-value is for a single statistic. So you have a null hypothesis, you compute the statistic from the data, you compare the value of the statistic to what it would be under the null, and then you reject the null or you don't reject the null. And you do that with a given type 1 error, which is the probability that you reject a null when, in fact, it's holding. So you're, 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 I think you call this false positive. I always get confused. But you know, you're being too eager to reject the null. You really shouldn't have, right? So the problem is that once you do more than one test, when you, once you do what is called multiple comparisons, then these type 1 errors are no longer what you think they are. So when you say, I think I'm take, using a p-value of 0.05, if you do two tests in a row, it's no longer 0.05. And it's, it's larger. So you're more likely to be too eager and have these false positives. So you, know, you think it's 0.05, in fact, it's say 0.1. The problem is, it's really, really difficult to figure out what the exact p-value is, or what the exact p-value is once you do multiple comparisons. And there are a number of uh, solutions, well, they're not really solutions, a number of approaches to deal with that out there. Uh, the two uh, most common Bonferroni bounds and false discovery rates, and I'll, I'll just spend a little bit of time on this. As I say here, none of these is fully satisfactory in that they're just bounds. They're not, you know, it doesn't tell you my p-value 
is 0 0.0153. No, it says it is most likely um, within these bounds, right? But are you close to the bound or far from the bound? You don't know. It's really basically a more conservative way of interpreting this. So it wants you to reject fewer null hypotheses because of these multiple comparisons. You probably remember from your intro stats class, if you test long enough, eventually it's going to be significant. Well, that's what multiple comparisons is about, you know, that, uh, to caution you from that. So the idea, and a lot of these ideas come from the work of Efron and Efron and Hasty um, in this book that I mentioned, um, statistical Comput com Computer Age Statistical Inference. So the idea is that you want to figure out the probability of making one false rejection out of all your comparisons that you carry out. And that's kind of a target. And that target is called the family-wide error rate. Why? Don't ask me, okay? I read this somewhere. So that makes sense to me, but apparently it does. So that's this alpha. So that's kind of our target. Uh, it's not really a target p-value, but it's a target overall type 1 error. The tar target risk you are willing to take to reject the null when in fact it is valid, it is true. And so uh, what should this target be? And there again there's no real um, um, consistency. Based on a lot of large data analyses, Efron and Hasty suggest 0.1. And I, I just want to highlight this because this target is not the p-value. So when you maybe read a few weeks ago this new you know, opinion piece that said, you know, by about 70 statisticians that said, forget about 0.05, let's go with 0 0.005. You know, and it's, it's actually interesting, there's a table in Efron and Hasty that has Fisher's interpretation of p-values, and so what is the evidence against the null hypothesis, and 0.05 is only weak. You know, I don't know somehow the literature kind of converged on 0.05 because of the normal distribution and 95% coverage, is two standard deviations, all that stuff. But really, there's no good reason to do that. And there's a lot of reason to, especially in large data analyses, which are basically glorified fishing expeditions, you know, you don't know what you're looking for, you don't want to reject, right? You want to make sure when you find a gene that tells you whether you have cancer or not, that's the right one, right? So that, that's really where all this comes from. You have thousands and thousands of these things. You know, how do you know that this is really something meaningful? And significant is also out the window. We don't use that term anymore. Well, I mean, people do, but... Efron and Hasty also strongly recommend to use the term interesting observations rather than significant. Significant is too loaded. So basically, in this concept of the fishing expedition, we find something, aha, this is worth focusing on. That's really the spirit in which this is developed. We have the definite answer here. Discussion is closed. So, um, I mean, the way statistics, you know, it's a different way of thinking about it. So, um, and a, a very, there's a are very similar. Um, they're good if you don't, let's say your target value, let's take it as 0 0.05, you do five comparisons, what should you use in each of these comparisons? 0.01. So you divide your target p-value by the number of comparisons. So that works really well if you don't do too many of these, but in our these for each location. So for our example, there's only 85 observations. So you have 0.05 divided by 85. That's still a reasonable number. If you have 3,000 counties, that's already getting pretty small. If you have 40,000 house prices, forget it. Nothing is going to be significant ever, right? 
So um, that's a problem with Bonferroni bonds. So for example, to put it um, in concrete terms, you take uh, 0.01 as the target alpha value, given 99,999 permutations, you have, if you have more than 1,000 observations, you're out of luck in terms of Bonferroni. Nothing is going to be significant. If you take 0.05, then if you have more than 5,000 observations, you're out of luck. So keep this in mind. This is probably way too tight a bound. And that's the sense in the literature. Multiple comparisons. It doesn't work well for big data. So this is what happens to our locations. You know, for 0.05, about three, and for one, there's just one left. But again, in an exploratory exercise, this tells you loud and clear, even with this crazy criterion, there is something going on in the south of France that does not jive with the rest of what we're observing. So what is it? Somebody's telling people, don't give to charity? You know, who knows? Okay, false discovery rate. This is a good one. So anybody familiar with this? FDR is not Roosevelt, it's false discovery rate. So this is a way to basically a lot of statisticians working with large data sets and lots of comparisons realize this Bonferroni business, no good. It doesn't help us. I mean, what good does it do if you do an analysis and nothing is significant ever, right? So this is kind of a heuristic. It's a procedure that has certain properties, and in a Bayesian context, there's a very nice interpretation of it. But in practice, this is what we do. We take all the observations and sort them by the p-values. And then we compute, I'll show you in a second. So um, p, target p divided by n, that's Bonferroni, multiplied by the sequence number of the observation. And then we see whether the p-value that we have is less than this FDR value. And basically, formally, we find the sequence number, which we call I max, which is less than or equal to this particular expression. And let me show you how this works. So here, I've done this analysis. This is all in Geoda. We sort it, and then FDR is this ratio. So the first one is the bound that we had for Bonferroni, 0.01 divided by 85. The second one is 2 times 0.01 divided by 85. The third one, 3 times, and so on. So the first one, this 0 0.00003, means only 3 of our 99,999 random permutations were more extreme than the value that we observed. So that's very, very rare, right? So then we go up, and it's still less, it's still less, and then after the third one, so then the fourth one, three significant locations. That's at the bottom here, and that's with 0.05. Then, pointing to the south of France. So even though, you know, now we're being super, super careful, there is still evidence that something is going on there that warrants special attention. And that's what a lot of this exploration is all, all about. Think of genetic found that are highly suspicious and might provide evidence. So a um, couple of things to, to close. Um, it's exploratory. It suggests interesting locations. Remember, that we um, identify pattern. We don't identify process. Multiple processes. Processes can yield the same pattern. You know, apparent contagion and real contagion. Same pattern, different processes. It's also univariate, and there can be interaction between variables, and so the Univariate autocorrelation auto can be really because of correlation with 
something else that we don't include in the analysis. And or, but this is one case where scale mismatch can give you very misleading, potentially misleading results. One of the analyses I did once was for Southern California, Orange County. And in there, developers come in and build a thousand houses at the time. They're all the same. So if you're doing hedonic analysis, that's all about explaining the price of the house by its characteristics. If the characteristics are the same, the price is all the same. Very high local spatial autocorrelation at the parcel level. But Basically, what this maybe I shouldn't be analyzing this at the parcel level. There isn't sufficient variability in my data at the parcel level. And if I go to the neighborhood level or something else, then I get the variability back and then I get the insight back. So, this is one other way of interpreting results of a local autocorrelation analysis. Okay, the extensions, uh, everything you ever wanted to know in 10 minutes, that's going to be fun. Um, a lot of literature, this is, uh, I mean, this paper of mine is, has citations up the wazoo. I mean, has been literally applied to anything you can imagine, you know, our anthropology, archaeology, zoology, forestry, anything. Also, I'm afraid to say. Um, let me move uh, quickly just to give you an idea of how we extend this to multivariate context. Because this, as it turns out, is not that simple. So multivariate spatial autocorrelation, if you look at the literature, there's basically nothing there. And um, I looked at this way back one in the early 80s, and there was one paper, this paper by Wartenberg, who, in essence, used uh, principal components and included them, uh, included something like spatial lags in a principal component analysis but for global analysis only. And then about 10 years ago, some French stat statisticians picked this up again. And actually, this is where I got the idea of using this Gary data set, because that's the data set they used in, in their papers. And again, it's based on the global Moran's eye and bringing a spatial lag variable into the analysis. And then there's one paper that kind of makes a distinction between correlation and the spatial part. But it's, it's very tricky, if, especially for multiple because you have to differentiate the similarity of the variables, as I call, in situ, in the same location, similarity with the neighboring locations. And there's a lot of misconception of variate Moran's eye. Um, we saw a little bit of that. It's, it's in the notes. Maybe we didn't see it in the lab, but um, it, it's really difficult to make sure you do the right interpretation. So all the stuff we saw or didn't in the bivariate case for the global Moran's eye translates directly to the local case because it's just the same statistic. But then there's another way of thinking about this. And just to show you how simple this is, think of um, two variables. So two variables, um, the distance between two points in a bivariate scatter plot. So the observation is Z1, Z2. That's a point in two dimensions. The other observation is another Z1, Z2. So how similar are these? Right? You compute the distance between them in attribute space. So if they're close, they're similar. If they're far, they're not. We saw this indirectly when we did the EDA and we had the 3D scatter plot and then we had the parallel coordinate plot. So when you had the points close together in the 3D scatter plot, they were very similar in their attributes and their, the lines in the PCP were very close together, right? So now how do we you know, extend this notion of attribute similarity to some kind of locational similarity? Remember, it's always the combination of these two concepts. And one way you can do this is by, you know, you have the distance between two points. 
Now you take one point at one location and you find its neighbors in geographical space, not in attribute space. So it has neighbors in attribute space that are close to it, but we take the neighbors in geographic space and compute the weighted distance to these neighbors. That is a measure of similarity. In fact, that is what local Geary is. And because it's squares, it's additive. That's the beauty of it. So if you have cross products, very quickly you cannot really extend that cleanly to multiple dimensions without having matrix matrices involved. You know, that's what multiple regression is. But with this, it's a distance measure. You know, distance in two dimensions, fine. You add them up. Three dimensions, you add them up. So that's this notion of a multivariate local Geary, which is simply the sum of the univariate local Geary's along each dimension of the variance. So it's incredibly simple. Of course, you get into scale. So one thing that's easy is you divide it by the number of variables included, and then all these numbers are comparable. That's the easy part. The difficult part, two things. One is inference. What's the right p-value? And we're back to multiple comparisons. But only, not only multiple comparisons across the observations, but in some sense, variables. Even though it's not, you know, each of these are individual local Geary's. So each of these has an individual significance and we're adding them up. So the sum of these has some connection to the individual significance. What exactly it is, it's too hard. We're back to square one. You know, what do we pick as a p-value? And that's where FDR and Bonferroni come in um, to help. So the um, inference and interpretation is very easy. Um, the interpretation is about similarity and dissimilarity. And the way I find it easy to think about is um, think about two concepts of neighbors in space. One is an attribute space. Think of our points in the cube, in the data cube. Points are very close together in attribute space, right? One is a map. Points are very close together geographically in the geographic space. Now let's combine the two. And let's find the points that are close together in geographic space. Where are they in the attribute space? Are they also close? Bingo, we have a cluster. Are they not? We don't. So how do we decide whether they're close enough? You know, that's the million dollar question. And that's where we use this false discovery rate as one way to discover um, clusters, mostly clusters. Um, they, I, I find very little evidence of this similarity, but maybe that's because of the particular data sets I've been looking at. So we have a cluster map again. These are locations that are uh, similar, both in multivariate space and in geo geo geographical space. Um, this tension between the two, we're going to revisit it next week and the week after. It is part and parcel of multivariate analysis because you have two notions of similarity and how do you combine the two. Uh, with the univariate approach, we had our weights matrix, we were done. In multivariate, it's not. So um, just an example very quickly, and as I said, I ran out of time. And I have this for the French data, but I, I didn't put it in here. And we'll do it in the lab anyway. The reason I took this data set actually is for a different reason. This is one of the very few examples I've run into. This is a classic data set. Might have used it for some of the homework. It's a data set of sudden infant death syndrome deaths, this crib death in uh, North Carolina. And it's classic because it was used in Noel Cressy's text, Statistics for Spatial Data and used as an example by many people for new test statistics. But one of the things that's peculiar about this is that for one of the years, and I forget which one, uh, the first one, uh, it's not significant. So when Art Geddes 
and, and Keith Ord first presented their statistic that they said, okay, no problem of global what it is, and they showed the significant location. So even in the absence of global autocorrelation, we could find local the two variables, the same variable at the time, and the uh, significant locations as identified by a univariate local Geary with 0.05, just for the sake of it. Um, on the top here, we have location locations. I mean, this is strictly not right because there's multiple comparisons. You know, there's two tests. But roughly, these are the locations that match between the two years on the top. And then on the bottom are what the locations that a bivariate multi, a bivariate Geary, local Geary, as clusters. Um, so uh, my uh, very uh, closing slide is that um, difficult to interpret as the number of variables increases. So I thought it was going to help a lot. Well, it helps a little. It doesn't help that much. There's, it's still, uh, you, you have to use it in combination with other insights on multivariate similarity. And then, of course, we have our p-values again. Where I have found this very useful is in combination with the computation of principal components. And We'll talk about principal components next week. So if you combine something that I call spatializing the principal components, so you apply spatial analysis to the components, then it becomes actually, I think, quite powerful. So you have a bunch of variables. Uh, one of my former students did this for Chicago. 22 health indicators, reduce them to two, three principal components, look at the multivariate spatial clusters of the three components, and you find very strong.